This is the 10th video in our series about Lie algebras. And in the last video, we looked at the module of a Lie algebra or also the representation of a Lie algebra and saw that those two ideas were kind of fused together. They were one and the same. And today we're going to talk a, about a special type of representation or a special type of module, a so-called simple module, which is one which cannot be reduced any further. Okay, so let's look at the proper definition. So let's suppose that L is a Lie algebra and V is an L module. Then we say that V is irreducible, so it's an irreducible module or an irreducible representation if you're working with representations or also a simple module, those are two different synonyms for the same idea, if V is non-trivial, so it is not the zero vector space, and it does not contain any proper submodules. So we looked at the definition of a submodule last time. It was essentially a vector subspace of W, which was L invariant for all the elements of L. So in other words, if you acted by an element of the Lie algebra, you landed back in the vector subspace. So let's look at a nice classic example. And uh, that is the example of the Heisenberg Lie algebra and its Fox space representation. So we looked at this as a module last time. Now we're gonna show that it's a simple module. So let's recall that the Heisenberg Lie algebra, the one that we're working with, which we'll call H hat, is spanned by the vectors a sub n as n goes over all integers and a vector k. Then k is an element of the center, so its bracket with anything inside of h hat is zero. And then the bracket of a m with a n is equal to m delta m plus n zero times k. Then let's take V to be the set of all polynomials with infinitely many variables, x1, x2, x3, so on and so forth. And then the way that H hat acts on V is via the following rules. So A acts on a polynomial by multiplication by lambda. K acts on a polynomial just by multiplication by the number one. And then if n is a natural number, a sub n acts on the polynomial by partial differentiation with respect to xn. So that's what we have here, partial p with respect to xn. And then a sub minus n acts on the polynomial by multiplication by xn. Okay, so like I said, we did that in the previous video. Now we'd like to show that this is a simple H module or H hat module. Okay, so let's get to it. So let's suppose that we have a submodule. And what we'd like to do is show that this submodule is the entire module V. So let's do that. So let's suppose that W is a submodule. I guess we're supposing that it's a non-trivial submodule. And let's take a polynomial inside of W. So that'll be zero not equal to P of X inside of W. Again, we're supposing that it's non-trivial submodule so we can find a non-zero polynomial in there. And now let's introduce the following total ordering, which I'll write as this fancy less than symbol, sometimes called the precursor symbol, on monomials of V. So notice that V is the uh, the vector space of polynomials, well, it's spanned by monomials. So we're defining a total order on the monomials. So it's going to be defined as follows. So xm1, xm2, all the way up to xmk is less in this ordering than xn1, xn2, all the way up to xnl. And I know I've reused k here where I've got a vector k up here. So I think that's okay here just for the setting. k is an index down there. And this is true if L is bigger than k. So in other words, if the degree of a monomial is bigger than the degree of another monomial, then it is larger in the grading. That's what we have here. Notice that there are L terms here where there are k terms here. So the one with larger number of terms is bigger in the ordering. 
But now, what if they have the same number of terms? Well, we've got to somehow come up with a decision as to which one is bigger if they have the same number of terms. And, that, and for that setup, we'll use so-called lexicographic ordering. Okay, so let's write that down. So we have xm1 all the way up to xml is less than, in this ordering, xn1 all the way up to xnl if the following is true. So m1 is equal to n1, m2 is equal to n2, all the way up to mr is equal to nr, but then mr plus 1 is less than nr plus 1. So in other words, these share a bunch of the first terms, but at some point you get to a place where they don't share terms, and the first place they don't share terms the one over here with the n indices has larger terms. Oh, and I guess I should say that we're writing each of these monomials kind of in the obvious way where we're starting with lower indices and working towards higher indices. So in other words, here we have m1 is less than or equal to m2, all the way up is less than or equal to mk, and we've got a similar ordering here for the n's. That makes this whole thing work, that we're kind of writing the monomials in the right order in the first place. So why is this called lexicographic ordering? Because it's like we order things in alphabet. It's like alphabetical ordering. So notice that if xm1 is equal to xn2, that would be like they're starting with the same letter. And then, well, if you go to the next letter and they're still equal, then they have the same second letter. And, well, they're going to have to differ at some letter, otherwise they're the same monomial. And the first place they differ, you pick the larger one and you say that that's the larger monomial. Okay, so anyway, that's what we have here. And now, how are we going to use this? Well, let's take the largest monomial, and we'll say that that monomial is xm1 all the way up to xml, from our polynomial P of X. So just think about all the monomials in P of X that build P of X. Since this is a total ordering, we can take the largest monomial in that ordering. And that is that if we take the vector AM1, AM2, all the way up to AML, and we act on our polynomial P of X, something special happens. Now, we've got to be careful exactly with how this, this is working like in terms of the associativity. Here we're acting from the inside to the outside. So acting by AML to P will give us something else inside of W, and then acting with the next one will give us something else inside of W, and so on and so forth. And that's because W is a submodule. But notice that by the definition of the action, this will give us the partial of p, well, it'll give us the lth partial of p with respect to xm1 all the way up to xml. But notice that that partial will extinguish or get rid of all of the monomials that are lower in the ordering than this monomial that we've chosen. And that's by our construction up here, which our construction is based off of the action kind of obviously. But what does that mean? Well, that means that we're only left with the partial with respect to x1 up to xml of this largest monomial. But if we take that partial, well, we're going to get the number 1. Oh, but it's attached to some certain coefficient. So what we'll get is the coefficient of xm1 all the way up to xml in our polynomial p of x. But that's simply a number. But what does that mean? That means a number is inside of w because, well, p is inside of w and, well, w is an invariant subspace. In other words, it's a submodule. So all of these acting on p will also land in w. But also, all of these acting on P gives us just a number. But if a number is inside of W, by scaling that number, that means the number 1 is inside of W. 
Oh, but if the number one is inside of W, that means that in fact, all monomials are inside of W. And we can see that because if you take the monomial Xn1 up to Xnk, that's the same thing as A sub minus N1 acting all the way up to A sub minus Nk acting on the number one, which is inside of W. But if all monomials are inside of W and every element of V is spanned by the monomials, that means that everything in V is inside of W. In other words, V is equal to W. So we started with the submodule, and then we showed that our submodule is in fact the whole module, but that's exactly what we need for this to be a simple module. Okay, so we've got an example of a simple module. Now let's look at maps between modules. Okay, let's suppose we have two L modules, V and W. Then a linear transformation, as like a vector space linear transformation, from V to W, which we'll call theta, is an L module homomorphism, or sometimes called an intertwining operator, if for all elements X of the Lie algebra and elements V of the L module V, we have theta evaluated at X dot V is equal to X dot theta evaluated at V. So inside of here, this X dot V is the action of the Lie algebra on the module V. Whereas out here, x dot theta of v is the action of x on, well, something from w. So those actions might be quite different, even though we're using the same symbol there. So that's just an abstraction. The dot could mean different things depending on the setting. So now let's look at a classic result involving maps between L modules, and these are the isomorphism theorems. So we'll maybe prove one of them and leave the other two for homework exercises as they follow fairly similarly to all other proofs of isomorphism theorems. Okay, so let's suppose we've got theta, which is an L module homomorphism from V to W. Then the kernel of theta is a submodule of V. The image of theta is a submodule of W. And then the quotient module, V mod the kernel of phi, is isomorphic to the image of phi. Okay, so let's get to this first bit. So, in other words, we want to show that the kernel of theta, I think I said phi before, I meant theta, the kernel of theta is a submodule. So let's suppose that X is inside of L and V is inside of the kernel of theta. And what would we need for this to be a submodule? Well, we would need that x dot v is also in the kernel of theta. So let's point that out. That's what we want to show for this first bit. So what does it take for x dot v to be in the kernel of theta? Well, theta needs to map it to zero. So let's look at theta evaluated at x dot v. But theta is a Lie algebra, or sorry, uh, an L module homomorphism. So that means that this is x dot theta of v. But then v is inside of the kernel, so theta of v is 0. So this is x dot the 0 vector, which is the 0 vector. But like I said, that's exactly what we need for x dot v to be in the kernel, so we're good to go here, meaning that this is a submodule. So now let's show that the image is also a submodule. So let's suppose that we've got x, which is inside of L, and w is inside of the image of theta. And let's again point out exactly what we need here. So in other words, what we want to show. And that is that x dot w is also in the image of theta. Okay, so how could we do that? Well, note that since w is in the image, that means that there exists a v inside of v such that theta evaluated at v is equal to w. And now we can just take it home from here. So let's notice that x dot w is in fact equal to x dot theta of v, just replacing w with theta of v. 
but this is going to be equal to theta evaluated x dot v. But observe that theta evaluated at something is definitely inside of the image, so this is inside of the image of theta. Exactly what we need to finish this second part. Now let's look at this V mod kernel of phi. Now let's define a certain map, and I'll call this map theta hat, from V mod the kernel of theta into the image of theta. And how will it do that? Well, we'll say that theta hat evaluated at, well, what do we need? We need V plus kernel of theta. So that's a coset will be equal to theta of V. So that clearly goes into the image. In fact, this is maybe clearly a well-defined bijective linear transformation just by the first isomorphism theorem on vector spaces. So what we really need to check is that this is an L module homomorphism. So let's see how we might do that. So let's look at theta hat of x dot v plus kernel of theta. So notice that that's going to be theta hat of x dot v plus kernel of theta. And that's just by the action of x on the quotient space there. Okay, but now we can apply this rule up here. And that'll give us theta of x dot v, again, by the way that the map is defined. But now we'll use the fact that theta is a Lie algebra homomorphism, or I should say an L module map. So this gives us x dot theta of v, but then that's going to be x dot theta of v plus kernel of theta. Again, sorry, that should be a theta hat there, just unwinding the whole thing. But now starting here and ending here is exactly what we need for theta hat to be an L module homomorphism. But since it's bijective as a linear transformation, it's bijective as an L module homomorphism, meaning it's an isomorphism, but that's exactly what we need for this third point. Okay, so now I'm gonna state the second and third isomorphism theorems, but we'll leave those as homework exercises. So here are the other two module isomorphism theorems. So if u and w are both submodules of v, then u plus w and u intersect w are also submodules of v. Then u plus w mod w is isomorphic to u mod u intersect w. So that's the second isomorphism theorem. So like I said, I'm gonna leave that as an exercise. Then if we have the same set as, setup as up here, but additionally u is a submodule of w, then we know that v mod u mod w mod u is isomorphic to v mod w. So this is the third isomorphism theorem. So notice built into this is the fact that w mod u is a submodule of v mod u. So you'll have to check that as well. Again, that's going to be left as an exercise. Okay, let's move on. Now we're moving to a very important and classic result involving module homomorphisms. And this is called Schur's lemma. And so let's suppose that L is a complex Lie algebra. So before we were just over any field, but now we're over the field of complex numbers. And then V is a finite dimensional simple L module, where theta is an L module homomorphism from V to itself. Then under this setup, theta must be a multiple of the identity map. So that really restricts the type of module homomorphisms from simple modules to themselves. Okay, so let's see how to do this. So how do we do it? Well, let's take lambda inside of C to be an eigenvalue of our map theta. We know that we've got an eigenvalue in the first place because we have a finite dimensional vector space and it's a complex vector space. So those two things together tells us that we in fact have an eigenvalue. Notice that if we had a real vector space, we potentially may not have an eigenvalue. Just think about rotation matrices. Those don't have eigenvalues over R. Okay, great. And then uh, let's let V inside of V be the corresponding eigenvector. So any eigenvalue clearly comes with an eigenspace and thus it comes with an eigenvector. 
So what does that mean? That means if we do theta evaluated at v, that's the same thing as the scalar multiple of lambda of v. But that's the same thing as saying that v is inside of the null space of theta minus lambda times the identity map on v. In other words, the kernel of theta minus lambda times the identity map. OK, but note that that means that the zero vector space is not equal to this null space because v is inside of that. And I guess I should say v is non-zero. But saying that it's an eigenvector means that it's a non-zero vector in the first place. That's the definition of an eigenvector. OK, so we've got the zero vector space is not equal to this null space. Uh, this null space is a vector subspace of v. And it's actually pretty easy to check that it is a submodule. OK, so we've got a vector subspace, which is a submodule. But that submodule is not the zero vector space. But we have a simple module. We assume that v was a simple module. So simple modules don't have any submodules. So that means that this has to be the entire module. In other words, the null space of theta minus uh, lambda times the identity map is equal to v. But if the null space is equal to everything inside of v, that means what? Well, that means that for all, I'll call it little u inside of v, theta evaluated at little u is equal to lambda times little u. Again, that's because this little u will be inside of this null space, which is the same thing as this equation, theta of u equals lambda times u being satisfied. But this being satisfied for all u tells us that theta is in fact equal to lambda times this identity map, which is exactly what we needed. OK, let's move on. Next up, we're going to look at a really important result that follows from Schur's lemma about abelian Lie algebras and their modules. So let's suppose that we've got a complex Lie algebra L, which is abelian, which means the bracket is identically 0. And let's also suppose that V is a simple finite dimensional L module. Then what we'll show is that the dimension of V is 1. So all simple modules of abelian complex Lie algebras are one dimensional. OK, so let's get to it. So let's, say, so let's say for x inside of the Lie algebra L, we'll define the following map. I'll call it theta sum x, and it goes from v to v. And it'll be defined by this. So theta x evaluated at little v will be x dot v. It's easy to check by the definition of the action of a Lie algebra on a module that this indeed defines a linear transformation. And it indeed defines, and it also defines an L module homomorphism. Let's check that. Check that. So let's note that theta sub x is, which goes from v to itself, is an, an L module homomorphism. OK. Well, so let's say we have y dot theta of x evaluated at v. So that's going to be y dot x dot v by the definition of theta of x. But then that's going to be the same thing as x dot y of v minus the bracket of x with y acting on v. And this is by some rules inherent in the Lie algebra module structure. So let's recall we had a rule for x bracket y dot v. Oh, but we've got an abelian Lie algebra, so that means that this bracket is equal to 0. So we've got y dot x dot v is equal to x dot y dot v. But that's the same thing as theta sub x evaluated at y dot v. But let's see, starting here and ending here is exactly what we need for this to be an L module homomorphism. So that means we've got an L module homomorphism. And so now that means we can apply Schur's lemma to take some lambda sub x inside of the complex numbers, 
such that theta sub x is equal to lambda sub x times the identity on v. And so this lambda may indeed depend on x, the element of the Lie algebra, but that's okay. So in other words, we have the following result. For all x inside of the Lie algebra, if we do x dot v, well, that's going to be the same thing as theta sub x evaluated at v, which is the same thing as lambda sub x times v. But let's take a step back and see what we have. We have for all vectors v acting by any element of x simply gives us a scalar multiple of v. But that means that the span of this vector little v, which is one dimensional, is a submodule of our entire module v. But if we have a one dimensional submodule and we supposedly have a simple module, that means that our simple module itself has to be one dimensional. Otherwise, we would have a one dimensional submodule. So, in other words, here we have that our capital V is in fact equal to the span of our little v, because we're not allowed to have submodules, which is the same thing as saying that the dimension of v is 1. But that's exactly what we needed here. Okay, let's move on. We're going to finish this off with the notion of an indecomposable module, which is different than an irreducible module in a really important way. And it's kind of like the difference between a prime element of a ring versus an irreducible element of a ring. Okay, well, anyway, let's get into the definition. So we say that an L module V is indecomposable if there are no non-trivial submodules U and W, where V is equal to the direct sum of U and W. So the important way to read this is that it might have submodules. It's just you can't use those submodules to decompose it into simpler parts. That's why it's called indecomposable. Then other than that, we say that something is completely reducible if, well, you can write it as a direct sum of all irreducible or simple modules. So here's a really important fact. And that is if you have an irreducible module, a simple module, that is also an indecomposable module. Because notice if you've got a simple module, well, there are no non-trivial submodules in the first place. So since there are no non-trivial submodules in the first place, you definitely can't write your thing as a direct sum of them. It's kind of vacuously true. That being said, an indecomposable module may not be simple or irreducible. And that's what I'd like to look at with the following example. So let's take L to be the Lie algebra of upper triangular 3 by 3 matrices. And we'll take V simply to be C3, the three-dimensional complex vector space. And the action here is just left multiplication by the matrix. And our claim here is that V is indecomposable, but not irreducible. And we'll first like generate a couple of submodules of V, meaning it's not irreducible, not simple. And then it's kind of clear that V cannot be written as a direct sum of those submodules. Okay, so let's get to it. So let's suppose that W is a submodule. Then what we want to do is take a non-zero vector, which I'll say has entries x, y, z, is inside of w. And now let's hit that with an arbitrary element of L, which I'll write out. It's got this upper triangular form. Okay, so doing standard matrix multiplication here will give us what? So we'll have a1x plus a2y plus a3z in that upper entry. And the next entry, we'll have a4y plus a5z. And in that lower entry, we'll have a6z. Okay, so that's inside of W. And notice that that's going to be inside of W for all choices a1 through a6 inside of the complex numbers. Because we can maybe like turn the knobs on these values of a1 through a6, and we're still inside of the Lie algebra. So what does that mean? So in particular, 
we can choose values of a1 through a6 so that x0, 0, 0, 0, y0, and 0, 0, z are inside of w. So that's pretty easy to do. So for instance, to get x0, 0 inside of w, you would take a1 to be 1 and everything else to be 0. Then to get 0, y0 inside of w, you choose a4 to be, to be 1 and everything else to be 0. And then let's also note if z is not equal to 0, that tells us that the vector 0, 0, 1 is inside of w. So recall that x, y, z is inside of w, but one or more of those could be equal to 0. It's just the whole thing can't be the 0 vector. So now let's just suppose that z is non-zero, meaning that we can scale to get 0, 0, 1 inside of w. But now let's note the following. If we take the matrix 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and multiply it into 0, 0, 1, we get the vector 1, 0, 0, which is inside of w. Because, well, we acted by an element of the Lie algebra into something from w to get something else in w. And then similarly, we can get 0, 1, 0 is inside of w. But look at this. If z is non-zero, then the three basis vectors for v are inside of w, which tells us that v is equal to w, meaning it's not a submodule, or it's not a proper submodule. So what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that in order to have a proper submodule, we need z to be equal to zero in order to have a proper submodule. So that gives us an example, w, which is equal to, let's see, x, y, zero, where x and y go through all complex numbers. That is an example of a proper submodule of v. Okay, well, let's maybe get rid of what we have on the board and we'll show another proper submodule of V. Okay, so through very similar calculations to what we just did, we can get that the only two submodules of V, well, I should say non trivial proper submodules of V, are these things that I'll call W1 and W2. W1 has anything as an entry in the first two spots, but then it must have zero in the, in the third spot. And then W2 has any entry we want in the first spot, but then zero in the second two spots. But now let's notice that we have the following chain of submodules. So the trivial submodule is contained inside of W2, which is contained inside of W1, which is contained inside of V. So since we've got submodules, we know that V is not irreducible because any irreducible or simple module cannot have submodules. That being said, these are the only two submodules to work with, and it's pretty clear that V is not equal to the direct sum of these two submodules. But since V is not the direct sum of these two submodules, and like I said, those are the only two to work with, that tells us that V is in fact indecomposable. So what do we have? Well, we've got a non-simple, in other words, non-irreducible module that cannot be decomposed, so it's an indecomposable module. Okay, so that maybe clears up this fact up here, which like I said, was really important. Okay, so now I'll leave you with some exercises. So here are three nice exercises built off what we've done. So the first is to provide full proofs of the second and third isomorphism theorems. Then next, let's suppose that we have a complex Lie algebra L and a finite dimensional module V. Then for all elements little z of the center of L, there is a number lambda sub z such that z dot V is equal to lambda z times V. So here we've got an action by the Lie algebra, well, an element of the center of the Lie algebra, and here we have scalar multiplication, and that's gonna hold for all vectors V and V. Next, let's suppose that we've got a one-dimensional L module V. 
Then for all x in the derived subalgebra, so I'll let you look that up if you need to, but we worked with that several videos ago. We know that x dot v is equal to zero for all elements v and v. In other words, the derived subalgebra acts trivially on a one-dimensional module. And that's a good place to stop.